Okay. Uh, okay, so Canadian Bioinformatics Workshops, uh, just a reminder of the Creative Commons for, for the content. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, AMR analysis, which I'm sure is important to a fair number of you, considering how critical it's becoming. Um, and then the, the lab and the lecture sort of mirror each other. So the things I do in the lecture, we're going to come back to and touch upon in the lab. Uh, and my main goal is really practical oriented. There's a lot to in, in the AMR field to track, but not all of it's important to you. So I'm going to sort of highlight where the decision points come from. Uh, so the learning objectives, you'll understand the molecular basis of AMR. You'll understand AMR reference sequence databases, how they're created and used, how to predict uh, antimicrobial resistant genes from genome assemblies or from metagenomic uh, sequencing reads. And we'll talk a little bit about the promise and pitfalls of predicting phenotype from, from se sequence information. So probably don't need to review this too much in this uh, audience. You know, uh, the simple uh, message is that bacteria are evolving resistance faster than we can bring new drugs to market. Um, and the tweet on the left particularly stands out. This is a UTI infection from Spain, where everything they test except for Avibactam, uh, they were resistant to. Um, and so, you know, this is unfortunately just more and more common. Uh, so this is a, a Canadian statistic. It's not just uh, in mortality, but it's also in illness. Uh, so, you know, Canada's predicted uh, by 2050 to be close to 400,000 lives, 120 billion in hospital costs, and nearly 400 billion in, in GDP. Um, you know, and then underpinning that is the loss of modern medicine. If you can't control secondary infection, you can't get a lung transplant, a hip replacement, you can't undergo chemotherapy, etc. So, What's really remarkable, and it sort of drives sort of what we're going to do in the lab today, is the diversity of molecules involved. It's not like we're dealing with one small group of, of compounds. We're dealing with a huge diversity chemical space uh, of compounds that uh, we've discovered over the years and have been losing over the more recent years. And particularly on the left here is it's not that we're just resistance is, is taking them off the market, but we aren't finding any more. Uh, and particularly antibiotics that discover gram negatives, and we really haven't found anything decent since the 1970s. Uh, and there has been sort of discovery gaps since the 80s. Uh, and so it's a double whammy, bacteria are overcoming these drugs, and we're really not finding any, anything fundamentally new, with a few notable exceptions. For the most part, we're talking about pathogens that we're quite familiar with. You know, my grandparents' generation thought this year gonorrhea was trivial. They had a, a shot of penicillin and it was over, right? But every decade that goes by, less and less drugs are available to treat this. And we have basically completely untreatable strains. So it's not like we're dealing with fundamentally new pathogens for the most part. The big challenge of controlling EMR and, and uh, getting surveillance data around it is that it's not just in the clinic. It's not just uh, people. So antibiotics are used in agricultural settings. Antibiotics and antibiotic resistance genes get into wastewater, therefore get into environment. Uh, they're involved in agricultural processes and fuel production. So it's a really complicated, in Canada, we call this the, the confusogram. Uh, this idea has been around since 77, and Canada in particular has a major federal effort to sequence across this space to understand how both pathogens and antimicrobial resistance genes uh, move around. But so if you might only be working in one of these sectors, but you're not in isolation, uh, it's really important to try and understand that you're connected to a much more complicated web, whether you're dealing with a pig on a farm, a fish in a, you know, in a stream system, or a person in the clinic. Overall, though, the metaphor of how we annotate resistomes is pretty simple. We perform DNA sequencing, and yesterday we talked about the many options for that. Uh, and so you have to choose your sequencing platform. And that sequencing data is compared to reference sequences, things that we know about AMR. Uh, and then that can lead to prediction of the resistome. So the resistome is the catalog of genes and mutations that confer resistance. And this is the tool of AMR surveillance. Where are the genes? Where are the mutations? How they move around? Then the holy grail is at the bottom right. Can we take those lists of genes and mutations and actually predict what the bacteria is going to do, what its phenotype is going to be? So this leads to risk assessment and clinical decision-making. Antimicrobial resistance genes that barely generate a phenotypic resistance are not of high risk, right? But they are a potential future risk if they evolve to be more resistant. But those now that are circulating that are quite potent are really important for risk assessment and decision-making. There's really three fields involved in this. The, the reference sequence part is the art of biocuration, how you take knowledge and you digitize it. Uh, 
Bioinformatics is the algorithm space. So how do you annotate a genome, for example? And analytics is how you make reliable phenotypic predictions from genotype. We're going to talk about all three today. And in particular, in the lab, we're going to use my lab's product, the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance Database, our RGI software, uh, and we're going to show some of our machine learning results. Before we get into the nuts and bolts, there's a few things I want you to think about for context in your own decision making. Uh, figure on your left shows that antibiotics target a huge range of things in bacteria. Uh, therefore, they've evolved, uh, we've evolved, uh, bacteria have evolved a large range of ways to resist it. So drugs may target the DNA replication machinery. They may target biosynthesis or cell wall formation. But the bacteria may resist by spitting the drug out through efflux or uh, making the membrane impermeable to the drug by modifying or protecting the target or by chewing up the drug. Again, a huge range of drug classes and mechanisms. There are thousands of resistance genes. Not all of them are going to be important to you. Some of these drug classes you may not use in your systems. You would never prescribe them or use them in agriculture. So why would you care about the resistance mechanisms? So there are some decisions making which mechanisms, which drug classes, which targets are important to you. The sort of thing that's already come up in the course is uh, the elephant in the room of AMR is lateral gene transfer. So we know AMR is created by overusing or misusing antibiotics. But what makes this worse is that they often become associated with mobile genetic elements such as plasmids. So Finn's lecture this afternoon is going to be critical. This changes the game. This means that an infection uh, in one pathogen can suddenly be in many. So I'm going to, this is a screenshot from CARD's website. This is NDM1, so this is a, one of the high threat genes. This uh, undermines one of our uh, last antibiotics of last resort, and we really only have two. This gene was discovered in one patient in Northern India who then flew to England for additional treatment and it broke out and became a hospital acquired infection. It started in Klebsiella pneumonia, but you can see card surveillance work. It is in well over 30 pathogens because of plasmids and it is a global threat. And we've sequenced in our one little urban community about 500,000 people. And we found almost a dozen different plasmids carrying this, path, this particular gene. So the, particularly the lateral gene transfer is a key part, and that's why Finn's uh, lecture is a good thing to do. Um, how to think about analysis. So we're going to go back to this metaphor from the U.S. Department uh, Secretary of Defense from quite some time ago, where it says there are known knowns, the things we know. There are known unknowns, that is the things that we know we don't know. And then there's the true unknown unknowns, things we don't know uh, that we don't know. So what do you, you know, people giggle, but this is actually from black swan threat theory. Um, so this is how you look at threat. In AMR, it's the best is to look at from a threat perspective, which is why we do surveillance. So the known knowns are the genes and pathogens you are, we are routinely tracking. So in an average public health lab, this list is very short. We might only do PCR for 12 different targets. We may only do culture for a half dozen pathogens on a regular basis. So our known knowns when it comes to surveillance uh, is extremely small. And we might partner that with phenotypic testing, maybe test eight antibiotics regularly. Uh, and so it's a tiny fraction of what's out there. The known unknowns are the genes that we know about from the scientific literature, from research, from other surveillance, but we don't routinely track them. We don't have a PCR assay, we don't have a phenotypic test. And we all know, particularly after COVID, you always get variants. So the genes that are published once in the scientific literature, you know they will evolve and there'll be variants out there. In particular, mutation-based resistance, novel mutations occur. While we are doing surveillance, most of these uh, the things that um, we could surveillance are actually sitting in the known unknowns. We know about them, but we're not looking. And then there's the unknown unknowns. These are the emergent threats. You know, fortunately, they're not hugely common, uh, you know, uh, less than one a year of a truly new resistance mechanism or particularly potent um, uh, resistance gene. Um, but we, this is really sort of the hard part of surveillance. How can you find an emergent threat? Usually this is sequencing related to unexpected outcomes. So we see drug failure, we see fatalities, and we start to suspect something new is going on, and we start to look and research happens. COVID showed how quickly we can do that now as opposed to, say, five years ago. So DNA sequencing from a public health lab or a clinical setting really can change the game, whereas traditionally we could only afford a small number of PCR or phenotypic assays. Sequencing is agnostic. If you can get sequence, it will tell you about everything the known knowns, the known unknowns, and possibly about the unknown unknowns, depending on how good your bioinformatics is. Uh, 
The reason this course exists is that there's a massive training ground. How does a public health lab go from a traditionally molecular biology, PCR, with some phenotypic work to handling genomic data? Uh, and the most common we think here and we hear is the information all load. You know, you go from a lab that was tracking a half a dozen genes maybe by PCR and suddenly you're getting lists of 50, 60 genes from sequencing projects. How do you make decisions based on that? The next way to think about your work is sort of three vectors of, of thinking. So the first vector is what you're looking for. So on the left, I call it perfect match screening. Are you only wanting to keep track of genes that we know a lot about? So CTMX15, a very potent beta lactamase, many public health labs do PCR to track that. They're not interested in variants, right? They're interested, is this gene that I know that I could point to experiments that is a threat? Uh, I only want to track that. Or do you want to look for no novel functional variants? So you want the capacity to say, I have a relative of CTMX15 that I need to worry about that's making outcomes. Or are you trying to do surveillance for emergent threats? The next sort of uh, vector is what part of the genome? So on the left, are you really about acquired resistance genes that are born on plasmids and mobile genetic elements? These tend to be the highest threat genes. Uh, because of antibiotic usage, they tend to be incorporated with plasmids, become mobile. They are expressed reliably. They usually have high MICs. In the middle is, though, resistance by mutation, which is predominantly genomic. So is that important in your organism, such as tuberculosis, for example? And on the right, are you interested in the more subtle things? Intrinsic resistance, efflux, regular, regular control. So glycopeptide resistance in particular can come up uh, on this side. You're not going to be interested in all of these probably in your work. So you need to think where you're on this vector. Then the last vector is what's your data going to look like? On the left is when we culture our isolates and we do whole genome sequencing. So we get good estimates of the complete genome sequence with low amounts of error. So we actually have found whole antimicrobial resistance genes. This is the easy stuff to annotate. Or are we doing whole community sequencing on the right? So we're looking at sequencing reads, in other words, metagenomics, where the data is much more fragmented. This is you have some different choices. So where are we at as a field? On the left, perfect match screening for known genes particularly if they're acquired and they're plasmid-borne, and particularly if we're doing whole genome sequencing, we're doing really well. All the tools and databases do very well, particularly for the escape pathogens and enterobacter AC. Novel functional variants, resistance by mutation, uh, varied results, not as good. Pretty good effort in the gonorrhea and mycobacterium tuberculosis. Other pathogens with mutational uh, surveillance is modest, and the biocuration is modest. Where we're at the infancy is really bioinformatics and machine learning tools to predict emergent threats. Really still, it's about, we notice unexpected outcomes and we start looking for things. We don't really get early warning from sequencing. And we've seen some start on predicting how important efflux is or regulatory mutations and conferring meaningful resistance. Then the last part is the improvements even over in the last three years in whole genome sequencing or whole community sequencing or metagenomics. Uh, real advances, last time I taught this course, uh, this was in red, not in blue, but if you're doing sepsis, environmental monitoring, one health work, the algorithms and annotation space is really improved. Okay, so we're just going to uh, highlight a few of the areas. So biocuration first. So we'll talk about the elephant in the room. This is a screenshot from Wikipedia of available antimicrobial resistance databases, uh, and this is not the whole list by far. Uh, there, AMR is a big threat. There's a lot of funding in the system. There are a lot of groups internationally starting databases. A lot of them are targeted to a specific need. Uh, a small number are more broad in their scope. Some of them are updated on a regular basis. Some of them were built once and never updated again. Uh, it's messy. Uh, I, I'm a biocurator. I'll admit that we're in part of the field where everyone and their uncle is doing some work in this field, and there's a lot of boutique databases and software. And unfortunately, if you're in this space, you have to do some background reading to see which ones you like. Um, I'm going to mention the big three, but before I do that, I want to mention tuberculosis. Tuberculosis tends to have a very tight community, very tough organism to culture. So the metrics for determining MICs is quite different. A lot of it's likelihood mathematics based. There's been some really good efforts. The American Reseq TB effort just lost their funding and they're offline, but uh, we captured their data, thank God. Um, but TB tends to be a specialist space. So if you work in tuberculosis, 
you got to do your homework. Often there are very specialized resources. But the big three, if you're really thinking on, on, on general AMR annotation, are NCBI's Pathogen Detection Reference Gene Catalog, Res Finder in Denmark, and thus in, us in Canada, the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance Database. We are what you would call friendly collaborator competitors. We compete with each other, but we also work very tightly together, sharing data and, and correcting each other work, particularly the CARD and NCBI work in, in almost daily at times, uh, sharing data, discussing naming conventions and curation. Uh, ResFinder traditionally has been focused on the plasmid-borne threat, but have really branched out recently. So even though I run one database, honestly, you're doing well uh, in all three, though Finley might give you a different opinion. He's a big a fanatic on CARD, I would say. Uh, so CARD, we're going to focus on this database, but some of the principles apply to the others. Uh, as Emma talked about in her talk, we are ontology di driven. That is the distinction. NCBI doesn't really use an ontology. They're happy to use some of ours. ResFinder does not use an ontology. So we really came from a data science perspective. What gets in CARD? Uh, are the genes and mutations conferring resistance. And there's some rules. So Emma mentioned that we have hard rules. So the evidence, it must come from a peer-reviewed publication in PubMed. Uh, so it's not just someone emailing us and saying, I found an AMR gene. In that paper, there must be clear experimental evidence of MIC. So a lot of our curation is reading the actual methods and results section to see if it's a truly solid experiment. A lot of papers the AMR mutations often that they propose are actually correlative, not causative. You can't point out to a well-controlled experiment. You really look at association. And that means what's the level of evidence, what deserves to get in card. And then the sequence must be available. So if they don't make the sequence available, we're not interested. In red there is the beta-lactamases. Uh, this is an exception. So NCBI uh, leads the naming of beta-lactamases. We work with them. But because of the genomic error, essentially we're finding beta-lactamase sequences faster than we can do experimentation to validate them. So they are getting names based on sequence similarity. Only a tiny fraction can you actually find a paper with the experiment. Though there are some groups that are starting to do high throughput experiments with robots to actually generate this data. So we will catch up. But right now genomics is well ahead of what we're doing experimentally. Screenshot on the, on the right there, just these are the public health agencies using CARD in the last seven days, so we're busy, uh, to say the least. Uh, and the two arrows I highlight, this is what often stresses out researchers. So there are 5,000 reference sequences or AMR genes in CARD, including over 1,900 mutations. But the allelic diversity of those genes, there's over 300,000 possible alleles or sequences conferring antimicrobial resistance. It's a huge amount of information. But not all of it's going to be important for what you are doing, right? So we're going to, in the lab, particularly float through that on, say, what is important to you? What in CARD, it has this uh, antibiotic resistance ontology knowledge base. One of the things it does at the top uh, is it has a permanent accession numbers. It has nomenclature. And critically, it tracks synonyms. Genes get renamed over time, particularly the older ones. So we keep track of all that. So if you know an older name and that's what you're familiar with using, you'll still be able to find the data in CARD. Um, the bottom half is the ontology resist the resistance ontology knowledge base, not shown as a graph, but shown as a list. Uh, it tells you everything we know about in this particular family, the ANT6 family, including there's subterms there. So these are the four genes that are in that family. But you can see a relationship. It confers resistance to aminoglycoside antibiotic. You can see it's an antibiotic inactivation. So this is all our knowledge base that if you happen to find a gene in this family, all the information you could pull out of CAR. Zooming in a little bit more, some of the guarantees of CARD is no, you will always get uh, genes classified. So when you spit out results from annotating, you will have three columns explaining the classification. Every gene is in an AMR gene family. Every gene has a resistance mechanism described and every gene uh, has a list of what drug classes uh, it impacts. We highly curate almost at 100% the relationship between AMR gene families and drug classes. We are actively curating the relationship between individual genes and mutations and antibiotics. We have over 3,000 of those. But I will say those relationships that this gene impacts that antibiotic are qualitative statements in the ontology. We have the means to start curating the MICs, the quantitative, but we're in the early days of that. You can guess that it's a phenomenal amount of data. At this point, I'm actually convinced it might be cheaper to 
can use robots and do the screening myself and generate the data as opposed to, to read all the papers. And of course, with any family, you'll have individual genes. So at the bottom, there's the sequence of the ANT6IB gene from uh, Campylobacter. Uh, both the amino acids and the DNA sequences are there. Lastly, if you happen to look on card on an individual gene, this is the ANT6IA uh, gene. Outside of all that ontology stuff and the papers, you will see a section on molecular epidemiology. With this one gene uh, in the database, we run algorithms on every gene and card against well over 200,000 available genomes, plasmids, genome shotgun assemblies, genomic islands, thanks to Fiona Brinkman for the genomic island stuff. And we generate molecular epidemiology data. Where is this pathogen, where is this gene found? So resistomes with perfect matches, in other words, a, a identical encodes identical protein to ANT61A, or maybe sequence variants. Not only tells you what pathogen it is, but it flags on whether it's found in genomes, genomic islands, plasmids, whole genome shotgun assembly. So it gives you that contextual uh, data. This is a huge amount of compute uh, on our end. Most labs, you know, this is would just be out of the, you know, what they could do. So this is sort of our investment for the community. It takes about three weeks of hard compute on a supercomputer to generate all these data, uh, and we make it sort of available to everyone to use. And we're going to see how this type, this epidemiology result can inform your analysis. So overall, uh, it's a high quality reference databases. It is hand performed expert curation, but the curation is guided by some text mining algorithms that lead us to paper. We try to cover every gene and every mechanisms. We provide some analytics, which we'll talk in. And as Emma Format talked about, we use ontologies and the rest for data harmonization. And what hasn't uh, just recently that we actually provide a standardized naming convention for every single gene in the database uh, because machine learning people were pulling their hair out because the, the traditional nomenclature is so messy. Um, we have dedicated human curators and we update roughly one to every three months. Um, we can do emergency updates when a particularly new and awful gene shows up. So that's the biocuration. This is your reference data. I'm particularly looking at CARD, but you could use NCBI, ResFinder. The bioinformatics is how you use that to annotate new genomes. Um, so I'm going to give the example. A few years ago, colleagues of mine gave a seminar in the department and talking about a patient who had salmonella, uh, salmonella enterica in their spine, uh, a very abnormal place for that infection. A lot of interesting travel history, misuse of antibiotics, everything you expect. So a uh, really strange case. So what we do, of course, is we got a spinal tap and we cultured the salmonella. Uh, that's the genome up there, and we ran it through CARD's resistance gene identifier, which you're going to use in the lab today. What RGI does is compare this genome to all the knowledge in CARD and gives you annotation. And the website produces graphics like this. So this is the box, uh, or sort of the figure of the annotation of the genome. All the boxes on the outside, like uh, MDSB and, and box of one, Every single box on the outside circle is an individual resistance gene in this one cultured salmonella. This is a dangerous salmonella. Your average salmonella does not have these many boxes. Um, you might recognize some of these gene names. A lot of them, you have no idea what these gene names. So using the ontology, you can reclassify the data by drug class, which is now the, uh, the middle wheel. So you can see Panem antibiotics, fluoroquinolones, sulfinamides, et cetera, matrolides. And it actually tells you number of hits. So the Panem antibiotics, there are six genes conferring resistance uh, in this salmonella genome. So the reason we're able to make these different levels of interpretation is because there's an, a standardized ontology. So we can compute over that ontology to say, oh, those genes, how does it lead to drug classes, for example? Now, the figure on the top left has a green section that says perfect a yellow section that says strict, and a red section that says loose. Mind you, we're not showing those results. So this is why we go back to our threat theory. RGI provides results at three levels, perfect, strict, and loose. So the perfect hits are the known knowns. They are perfect, identical matches at the amino acid level to the curated gene in card. So OXA1 is in the green. OXA1, you know, we know there's dozens of good papers on its MIC levels. Finding a perfect hit to OXA1, that's a high threat result. In your lab, maybe that's all you care about. You're not interested in variants. And so you would only look at the green. The strict is where some bioinformatics come in. So the stricts are the known unknowns. These are variants. 
Um, but how do we know they're a functional variant? So RGI predicts that it's similar within some sort of model context and is predicting it's a functional variant. And we're going to come back to how it does that. So there's some bioinformatic magic to say this variant I see of a known gene, is it really functional or is it non-functional? If you're not passing that model, you're outside of the model, you become a loose hit. So a loose hit uh, it either is a, a, a new AMR gene, but often it's just nonsense, right? It's a homologous protein region, but the protein's probably interacting with some other type of small molecule. The vast majority of users never turn on loose. So really the only time you should turn on loose is when you look at your gene list and you can't explain your phenotype, right? Why am I getting macrolide resistance when perfect and strict does not show any macrolide resistance genes? That means you might've found something new and you need to start looking at the loose. The loose hits anything in there. If you think it's suspect, you've got to validate it. You need to clone and express it. So clinical setting, agricultural settings, they never use loose. They're, they can explain their phenotype from perfect and strict. Uh, researchers like, say, Jerry Wright at McMaster, who goes out to Weir's geologically isolated caves or ancient permafrost, often have to use loose. And when, in fact, one of his bacteria isolated from a geologically isolated cave could metabolize modern antibiotics, but had no perfect or strict hits at all. Uh, so he had to go into the loose and clone and express everything to realize that there was this longstanding threat uh, sitting in these cave bacteria. So again, you need to think about what do you care about? Certainly most of you won't care about loose. My lab doesn't use loose that often, but uh, the perfect or strict might be a tough call for you because those strict ones could be the ones that are explaining your phenotype. Now, another part that's unique to CARD, uh, it's not done at ResFinder, it's not done at NCBI or the other, is that we curate sequences in a model context. So this uh, model type is called a protein homolog model. You can also think it as a presence or absent model. Do you have the gene or not? Um, so this is the protein homolog model for ANT61A. And basically the model has two pieces of information. It has the protein sequence, which is at the bottom. It has something called a, blast, a bit score cutoff. So what RGI does is it predicts all the open reading frames in your genome that you sequenced. And it starts blasting those open reading frames against the sequences in CARD. So BLAST is a uh, short alignment, uh, you know, local alignment sequencing technique. So there's, I've got the screenshot of NCBI BLAST. But essentially what BLAST does is, oh, this gene in my patient's uh, pathogen's genome is alignable to a reference in CARD. And how good is that alignment? Well, the bit score statistic essentially measures how much information is in the alignment. A bit, you know, the bit is the smallest unit of information. So 500 bits are 500 of those. The better the alignment between a sequence in your, your query and something in card, the more bits it will have. And what happens is that our curators literally by hand analyze hundreds of sequences and they determine a bit score cutoff that if you're above it, you're likely a functional variant of ANT61A, but if you're below it, you're very unlikely to be a functional variant. In other words, you're a loose hit. Um, and so the bit score is to separate strict and loose. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of Karen's result, your TA. So we know that generally speaking, when CARD RGI calls a strict hit, says that you're a functional variant, it tends to be right. Uh, Karen's PhD work, she's starting to really put numbers on that and it's reliable. Sometimes, though, it misses things. So there could be a, a real gene in the loose, and that's where she's trying to make it better. But this is hand-curated inspected for over 5,000 genes. This homolog model, presence or absence, are you a functional variant, uh, is almost two-thirds of CARD. The next most common model is what's called a protein variant model. And this is about the drug targets, the housekeeping genes that antibiotics bind to, like a gyrase B. So if an antibiotic like fluoroquinolone binds to gyrase B, that protein is no longer functional, the cell dies. Um, all bacteria have gyrase B. So RGI is always going to find a gyrase B in your genome. But how you get resistance is the gyrase B picks up specific mutations. And if it picks up those mutations, it's still functional, but the drug, the fluoroquinolone, can no longer bind and do its job. So it's functional and now not sensitive to antibiotic. So what the protein variant model does is the exact same as the homolog. It uses a bit score cutoff to find the, the gene. But once it's found the gene and, and says, are you loose or strict, it will only report it if it also has some of these mutations that are reported in the literature that cause fluoroquinolone resistance. 
Some of these are single point mutations, some of them are combinatory uh, mutations. Um, and so this is the second largest sort of uh, model in CARD, all the housekeeping genes that confer resistance by picking up a mutation or two. And again, we hand curate all of these from the literature. And those of you who work in TB know that that is 99, 95% of resistance in TB. So we have a lot of curation to do to, to keep up to it. Overall, the knowledge in CARD is curated under eight model types. Um, this is a very unique thing to CARD. Uh, I think our two biggest contributions are the ontology and these models. Of all of them, and I give examples of known resistance genes under each type, only four of these types do we actually have code in the RGI software. So RGI can only predict genes in the top four green model types. And in fact, three of them have asterisks. They're not done yet. There's some mutations they still don't do well. Um, and so there's still, there's still gaps. So there may be knowledge in CARD that RGI can't use yet to annotate your genome. The bottom two, we've made sort of pilot uh, level. Uh, and the two in white, we've even not written a bit of code to that. So this is my biggest warning. There is no software in existence that can predict the complete resistome in any pathogen. Even if the data, the knowledge is curated in a database somewhere, the engineers have not caught up to write the code. So there are always false negatives when you annotate a bacterial genome because of gaps in knowledge or gaps in software. Okay, that was cultured isolates. What if you're doing culture-free metagenomics? So in our case, you know, taking a, a, a rectal swab in a baby in the NICU, uh, but others may be looking at wastewater. So you make your sequencing library from this sample, you sequence it, and the bulk of the data is going to be the, the host, the baby in my case, or the background DNA, you know, fish poop and, and all the rest in the water. And another huge fraction are going to be the bacteria that belong there, that this is where they live. We want them there. So the AMR genes in your sequencing data are a tiny slice of the data, and this graphic overestimates what that slice. So they're a needle in a haystack. Therefore, metagenomics takes a lot of sequencing, even just to see them, right? So it's very expensive. The data tends to be very fragmentary. It's short 250 base pair uh, sequencing results. The analysis is sensitive to the diversity of reference data. I'm going to come back to this. This is greatly underappreciated uh, out there on how the reference could be really important. But even then, if you do find AMR gene and metagenomics data, you don't know what bacteria it came from, which on a clinical setting, that's how you decide your treatment. So you know the AMR genes there, but if you don't know which bacteria are carrying them, you don't know what to do. You're back to empirical medicine. So uh, Jared actually talked about read mapping a little bit yesterday in the viral work. This is the workhorse of metagenomics annotation in AMR. Essentially, which gene that did that 250 base pair sequencing read come? And we use things like the Burroughs-Wheeler transform or read mapping. What that does is, is a high stringency mapping of the short sequencing read back to your genome. So this is a picture from Galaxy. So they're annotating a, a human genome in here. Whole bunch of short sequencing reads. They use the Burroughs-Wheeler transform to map them to a specific locations in the genome. And at the bottom, you can see that read one, two, and three have been physically mapped and mapped bioinformatically to one common region uh, of the genome. The key thing I want you to see about, unlike BLAST, which can be very generous, read mapping is highly stringent. They have to be quite similar for the mapping to occur. So uh, we're going to come back to why that's important, but this is a key thing. And the common software you'll see in the literature is BWA and Bowtie 2. And if you're man doing metagenomics, uh, I just this is only one thing I truly want you to walk, walk away for when you're done. Don't trust metagenomics for AMR using BWA or Bowtie 2. And I'm going to show you why that is the case. These algorithms in AMR sequence space can actually be misleading. And unfortunately, they are the bulk of the papers. So why is that? So AMR has what's called the allele network problem. This is the TM beta lactamase. Uh, it's an old screenshot. There's well over 300 of them now. TEMs uh, confer, confer resistance to beta lactamases. The convention is that er, even if they only differ by one amino acid, they get a different name because sometimes that one amino acid has considerable changes in MICs. So you have to track them specifically. But they evolve from each other. So TM1 might only be two nucleotides different from TM7. Uh, it's, a, it's a network of highly similar alleles that 
we have to keep track of because different alleles can have different phenotypes. But read mapping algorithms because, are that high stringency will have no trouble figuring out that the sequence they have is a TEM. It will get into that space. But when it gets down to MITEM1 or TEM7, when there might only be one or two nucleotide differences, to be honest, it almost guesses. Uh, and so it kind of it can tell some TEMs apart, but many of them, it, it just guesses on, on where the reads goes because they're just too similar for the algorithm. So I'm going to prove it. So this is some work that Amos did in our lab. We simulated a genome with tenfold sequencing covered metagenomics. And we simulated seven genes, uh, AMR genes in these genomes. And we used bow tie too. So on the right, uh, when we mapped all the reads, this is the results that RGI gave. It said, I found reads from all of these genes in your metagenomic sequencing, but we only simulated the seven with red arrows. So we simulated CTMX15, and a bunch of reads indeed were annotated, were mapped to that gene, but other ones were mapped to CTMM3, CTM, CTMXM157, CTXM114, CTXM101, etc. Because of those CTMs are one or two nucleotides different from CTMX15. It started guessing. The other reason you can tell there's a problem is on the y-axis. This is the map Q. This is a assessment of mapping quality. It's not a particularly high number at 35. So it was saying it was having trouble mapping because of these highly similar alleles. And then on the x-axis, completely mapped reads were 350. So we simulated more than 350 CTMX. M reads, but they got spread out amongst all these related to it. You look in the literature, you will find papers with lists of genes like this with different degrees of coverage. And they might claim that all of these AMR genes exist in, say, their wastewater sample or soil sample. It's probably not true because of the allele network problem. So we switched uh, to an algorithm called the KMA algorithm. This was developed by the ResFinder team in Denmark. It is a read mapping and alignment method specifically designed for uh, redundant databases with allele network problems. So same data, same RGI code. We just swiftly swatched out, swapped out Bowtie 2 for KMA. And if you look on the right, we only found seven genes. We only simulated seven genes, and we only aligned reads to seven genes. Five of them were the exact gene that we simulated. Two of them were an extremely close gene. So when you're down to one or two nucleotides, you still can't get it absolutely perfect, right? But KMA at least tells us that there's only seven AMR genes to it, and it said cat I instead of cat IB, right? you know, minor stuff like that. So... Like before, if I would used Bowtie 2, I might have claimed that there was a huge diversity of AMR genes, particularly CTMXMs, when really there were only seven. Look at the y-axis, the map Q has just gone through the roof. It was 35 before. So suddenly there's higher confidence in the mapping. And if you look at the map reads, we're up to 550, you know, is our high end. So the reads aren't being accidentally spread around a bunch of references. They are being aligned to only what they deserve to be aligned. So if you're doing metagenomics, if you walk from anything of this lab, please switch to KMA, is my answer. Now, the allele network problem um, has a second part to it. CARD, the reference data that I just used in the analysis I showed you, uh, the 5,000 genes in CARD, this is an old screenshot, vast majority of them come from clinical isolates, because that's what gets published in PubMed. Uh, described. So the sequence diversity in the reference set is clinical. So it doesn't reflect the diversity of genes, alleles, and mutations that you would find in clinical, agricultural, veterinary, or environmental settings. So if you're doing the NICU baby stuff like we do, card's perfect, right? But if you're off in soil, uh, you know, adjacent to a farm, um, or even just wild permafrost up north, you now have a bias. The reference data is highly clinical, but those alleles are probably not in your sample. And remember, Bowtie, KMA, are highly stringent read mapping. The allelic diversity you're sent your, of the sequences you're pulling out of soil, for example, might be just different enough that the aligner, the map read mapper, doesn't work. Uh, I did include a side, but we've quantified that, and, and you actually have this problem. So what did we do? This is why we did this molecular epidemiology work. We analyzed hundreds of thousands of genomes to find all the variants. And so while there's 5,000 AMR genes in CARD, there are over 300,000 
variants, alleles underneath those genes. And a lot of the alleles that we pull in our reference set when we do this are not from clinical settings. So you can change your reference set so you have more alignment diversity. The warning is these are all perfect and strict hits from RGI. So the perfects are fine. They match at the amino acid level. They're functional. But, you know, you are relying on the strict where you can't, for some of these 300,000 alleles, you can't point to a paper, right? Because they are predicted by RGI. They are a sequence diversity estimate, but no one's particularly cloned that one allele out of the 300,000. So you do have to keep that in mind. So a metagenomics workflow that I would suggest is you start with your metagenomic sequencing reads. Depending on what your sample's from, you might just use CARDS Canonical 5000 because you're working in a clinical setting. But if you're worried that you are actually pulling out much more interesting sequencing diversity from environmental other sources, you might also use the CARD in silico variant set of 300,000. You are going to absolutely use the KMA alignment to overcome the, the allele network problem. And you're going to get your read counts against reference sequences. And you will get something like this. This is from our, our lab today. Uh, this is generally you know, what people use as their metagenomics results. We're going to go through all the different statistics that come with this. But as, essentially, it comes down to a list of genes and how many reads have been mapped to them. The big thing I want to point out is KMA, Bowtie 2, BWA, they don't account for SNPs. So they only work against protein homolog models, those dedicated enzymes that are presence or absence. So the gyrases that mutate, there's no way to, to map the SNPs that you may find in the gyrases you sampled against the card. There's no algorithm space for that. So in metagenomic sequencing space, you're using about two thirds of CARD, the protein homolog models, these dedicated genes as opposed to point mutations of housekeeping genes. So like I said before, there are no algorithms out there that will predict total resistome from metagenomic data because metagenomic algorithms and workflows have generally ignored SNPs uh, when it comes down to it. One of the things that is coming along is you found the gene, you had 1200 reads against you know, OXO1, but you don't know who's carrying that OXO1. But that variant data set of 3,000 alleles, a lot of those alleles are only found in specific pathogens. And so you can look for signature subsequences called KMERS to say, well, I've got the OXA1, but this signature means it's the OXA1 in E. coli. This is the OXA1 in Klebsiella. This is the OXA1 in Pseudomonas, for example. So CARD, RGI, actually uses these minor, minor variants to actually predict which pathogen is carrying the AMR gene uh, that you observe. As you'll see in the lab, this is really beta stuff. It has not been validated yet. The code is awful at this point. It's really slow. So we have a new master's student who's doing that validation. I would expect we'll submit a paper by end of summer with validations that we can be accurate of predicting which pathogen bears your gene. I have this upper part in yellow. There is a possibility if you pull all the sequencing data uh, out of your metagenomics, you could bin them by their AMR gene family and subassemble and rebuild the alleles completely. And if you build alleles, then you can go back to the normal RGI that uses protein variant models, protein homolog models, efflux models, et cetera. So there is interest in not just counting the reads, but reconstructing the full alleles. Uh, and if that only depends if you have enough sequencing data. So we actually can go back to using the algorithms that can do SNPs and point mutations. I put this in yellow. Uh, we don't have this publicly available. We're still experimenting with uh, some of some of the some other papers. Is this something you're interested in? There's a few other groups out there that have got some beta software out there. Um, but this is really where this age of metagenomics, where you just count the reads aligned to things, we're going to move beyond that. We're going to start predict the underlying pathogen. We're start to reconstruct alleles and predict total resistance. So I'm hopeful we'll get to total resistance. Right now, if you're using metagenomics data to predict fluoroquinolone resistance, forget it. Uh, you're not, it's mainly SNP driven. Uh, therefore, you're not measuring it when you do your work. I wanted to mention this. Uh, this came up uh, a little bit uh, in, in um, Jared's talk, is the cost part. So generally, shotgun sequencing to find AMR genes is expensive. You got to pull out millions of reads just to find some reads with AMR. But bait capture, which came up yesterday in the viral work, is a, a real uh, benefit. So we release CARD on this website as a bait capture platform. So these are molecular fish hooks that when you have a metagenomics library, will grab only 
the library molecules that encode AMR genes and let everything wash out of the tube. And so that means you're sequencing, you only sequence a little because most of your sample is AMR. And this example, the paper's out, uh, the, the columns on the right are shotgun sequencing. Uh, so this is just uh, shotgun sequencing. In many of the rows, you see no data. You don't even detect the AMR genes. But when you use these molecular fish hooks that are designed based on all the genes in card and you wash out all in all AMR, same amount of sequencing on the left under enriched, you see with high abundance the AMR genes to it. Uh, we have a second paper out now where we're tracking AMRs in the NICU when it comes to probiotic usage. Uh, and I will mention one of the students uh, in the course, Dirk, is actually in the middle of validating uh, AMR, card AMR bait capture version two, uh, because this version, uh, there's some new genes have evolved and they're not in the, in the, the bait set. But now you can get away with much less sequencing. Most of your data that comes out of it uh, with the money saved is going to be focused on AMR only. But again, this is in protein homolog space, right? This is metagenomics. So we didn't make fish hooks for gyrases because they would grab out both the antibiotic sensitive and the antibiotic uh, resistance and waste our sequencing uh, effort. Okay, the last little bit. So analytics, can I predict the behavior of the bacterium based on the resistome list, the list of genes and mutations? Um, so that we tried it in E. coli. So. We worked with 115 E. coli, we sequenced their genomes, and we tested 18 antibiotics in a Vitec uh, setting. So we knew the MICs and we knew the genomes. We used RGI to predict the genes and mutations in it. And we simply said, given the ontology rules in CARD, if it says this gene causes resistance to this antibiotic, which was a qualitative statement in CARD, if we just take it as true and take these rules of this gene leads to these antibiotics, do we predict phenotype accurately? The answer is no. So the good results are in the dark colors, the, the, the blue and the teal. The bad results are in the orange and the yellow. So if you look at something like, uh, I'll look at the bottom, tobramycin, right? We only got, we were sitting about 80% accuracy. Some of them were ridiculously low, right? So this is because presence or absence of a gene or mutation is never enough. Things that are on plasmids like OXA1, yeah, they're going to, if you see them, they're going to be expressed at high rates. You'll get phenotype. But all the chromosomally encoded and other things, there's issues on expression, right? There's, an, there's regulatory issues. And that's why you see this massive gap between the list of genes and observed phenotype. But if you repeat this experiment where you take a training set where you know the, the genomes and you annotate them with RGI and you train it relative to the observed resistance of MIC in a Vitec robot, and you train a machine learning method and then give them these data, the exact same 115 uh, E. coli, suddenly you get extraordinarily good results, right? Tetracycline is almost the only one we're really worried about in ampicillin a little bit. We can predict the observable phenotype, admittedly in a Vitec robot, not in a patient, but we can predict that phenotype using machine learning or analytics. So this is where we're going as a field. There's lots of literature, early, early days, honestly, but within five years, uh, I'm betting maybe sooner with new, new algorithms that generative AMIs, we will have subsets where we feel that we can, with high reliability from genome sequence, predict phenotype. And that might be really important from the public health and risk assessment side. What's cool about these AIs is that you can crack them open and they make predictions. They say, well, who's causing the resistance? So in particular, CTMX15, the machine learning suggested that it, this gene was causing resistance to four drugs. Three of those drugs, we knew that from the literature. It was already occurred in CARD. But the fourth one, uh, cefazolin, no one had ever done that experiment. Right? It's not in CARD. There was no knowledge. And when we cloned it and expressed it, that's exactly what happened. That beta-lactamase caused resistance to that gene. So it was a broader threat. And in fact, six uh, beta-lactamases in E. coli, the AI predicted a broader range of antibiotics. And when we cloned and tested, it agreed every single time. Uh, so this is a, a future because the trouble with the literature is there's no standardization on who tests what antibiotics when they publish a new to AMR gene. Uh, I wish there was. That would make a curator's life easier. Um, but uh, AI can, can get us there. Is that my chat warning? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and I just want to flag this antibiotic resistance platform. This is from the Wright Lab at McMaster. This is an efflux deficient uh, e. coli platform that you can clone any AMRE gene in and therefore test directly uh, 
the MICs created by that antibody uh, by that gene against antibiotics without any efflux confusing it. So this is a standardized way to determine what antibiotics a specific gene confers resistance to. Um, I snapshot, but it's it's well over. It's getting close to 500 genes, and we actually hope to clone a lot of our mystery genes into this. If you got super excited by that, I want to put a little cold water on it. So this, we basically repeated the experiment with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, right? The same machine learning algorithms on all the ref uh, with 102 isolates, 18 antibiotics. And I'm not even going to show the graph. The machine learning is much less reliable in this pathogen, right? So even if we are going to get analytic prediction of phenotype from genomes, it's not going to be a panacea. It's not going to work in every type of infection, every type of, of you know organ or host. Uh, and pseudomonas, uh, tough, right? It, it, there's a lot more. It means probably we, there's, it might not all be genomically driven. It might be epigenetically driven or other factors that we're not, we're not looking at. So you'll see a lot of talk saying the future has come. We'll predict phenotype reliably. Uh, you know, bacteria are, are tough to work with. There will be exceptions. I think E. coli will get a long way. Other pathogens and infections, not so much. All right. Uh, last thoughts. I'm, uh, because I want to have time for questions. Um, I'm not going to do all these, but uh, you can look at them. But the plasmid-borne AMR genes are generally the high threat. And we're getting in the lab. We're going to show how we know which ones are on a plasmid or not. Um, always collect questions, how to deploy molecular knowledge. So you got to really think about those three vectors and what you care about and what part results matter to you and which results you're not going to look at. Um, all of this is computationally intensive. So the need for engineers to make it uh, more efficient. Uh, our K-MER algorithms, like they can't even run on the course computers, but with good engineering, they will in the future. Confidence is, uh, is always a challenge. You can always find the AMR genes encoded on plasmids, but resolving that complete plasmid can be very hard from sequencing data. Um, nanopore, we've talked a lot about in the next days. This is going to change the game, uh, but you do need GPU processors, which are expensive. Uh, to it. But uh, the plasma analysis software like uh, MobSuite is really coming along there. And then I'm just going to flag uh, bait capture. Uh, two year TAs, Maddie and, and Jay Lee's, one works in viral, one works in bacterial bait capture design. So they can they can answer some of those questions. And metagenomics is a big part of the future. I do think because even though sequencing costs are dropping, I think bait capture is going to still be a part of it. But Look at your algorithms, right? As I said, no one can predict total resistance, but things like bug dry 2 can actually give you wrong results. So you got to take the time to know your tools.